on the screen. Hello, so my name is Janine Vague, and, and, I'm, Alan, and I'm Alan Siegel, and, and we are. <laughs> and we are psychotherapists in the Columbus, Ohio area. And today we are going to be hitting the topic of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is something that I specialize in, utilizing the uh, training I took in cognitive processing therapy. And Ellen, you want to talk about the work? Well, people? I found that um, many people who come to me over the years, um, whether they have an official diagnosis of post-traumatic stress or a range of symptoms that um, certainly fall under the category. And to some degree, some people own their diagnoses. Some people are just working with the symptoms with, and there's a benefit to having a diagnosis. Sometimes there's a benefit to um, dealing with the symptoms on their own and not having a diagnosis. So we're gonna talk about something about that. Yes. And um, my background in training certainly is in cognitive behavioral therapy. I have um, uh, trauma stress training. I have, um, there's, a, there's a great um, tool called holographic memory resolution. And uh, so I can give a, um, a reference to that later when we get talking because that's something people can use for themselves uh, between therapy visits with their therapist. And if you had concerns and fears about going to a therapist, you could look into this because it's for, it's for anyone to use. Okay. So, Yeah, I would like to hear about that because yeah. I heard okay. about that. And you, don't, you and I do completely different types of work when it comes yes. to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, <clears throat> and it would, I think it would be interesting for you to say a little bit about the heart-centered psychotherapy. Uh, heart-centered oh, hypnotherapy. Heart-centered hypnotherapy. That's yeah. another uh, background and training that I have yeah. that, that one of the goals of it and the goals of your kinds of uh, treatments are too, to get to the heart or the root of um, the understandable emotional and psychic attachment to the effects of whatever trauma um, you've experienced. And this can be echoes of trauma from being when you're a child and it can play out later in life when the traumatic situations have happened later in life. And it's a way to heal and dismantle the effects. Okay. All right. Well, so I'd like to start out with a quote from uh, Dr. Bessel, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, um, someone who I met many, many years ago at Johns Hopkins at a somatic conference. And um, he writes a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is a book for people who want to understand a little bit more about PTSD and how it does affect our body. And so the quote that he has is, for every soldier who serves in a war zone abroad, there are 10 children who are endangered in their own house. So I just wanted to start with that because most people, well, for many years, people thought, oh, only military people get PTSD. And um, <clears throat> it's only been maybe in the past few decades, maybe less than that, I'm, I'm not even really sure, when we began to realize, no, this is something that also affects um, children who have been abused. And, um, and so just to, uh, and, and speaking of abuse, um, <clears throat> when you're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, the very first thing that has to happen is there has to be a life-threatening situation that either you are a victim of or you have witnessed in some way. And it can also be for someone who is working in social services or working in um, as a, a paramedic 
uh, a doctor, somebody who's working in the field with trauma, and um, that could be something that they also could experience post-traumatic stress disorder. Right, and this also means car accidents. Yes. It means whether you were at risk of death or believed you were at risk of death. Exactly. And also children in situations where for them, they experienced their life is at risk, even witnessing <clears throat> parents <throat> abuse each other and the child uh, integrates that they are in a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. If they um, act a certain way or, you know, witnessing things, um, like exactly. you said. <clears throat> exactly. And, um, and then, of course, sexual violence is also um, a way that people could get post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. as well. You may not necessarily think you're going to die, but you feel trapped in the situation. You feel as if you can't, you have no power uh, in the situation that you are forced into something. And I think that last part um, broadens the the definition, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are walking around thinking they have PTSD. And, you know, if you think it and, and you feel endangered, well, then you can use some of the tools to undo it. I have a definition okay. from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, <clears throat> it's more general, but Post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder that develops in some people who have experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. So here they're not even calling it life-threatening. It's natural to feel afraid during and after a traumatic situation. Fear triggers many split-second changes in the body to help defend against danger or to avoid it. The flight or fight response is a typical reaction meant to protect a person from harm. Nearly everyone will experience a range of reactions after trauma, yet most people recover from initial symptoms naturally. Those who continue to experience problems may be diagnosed with PTSD, and people who have a PTSD a diagnosis or have it may feel stressed or frightened even when they are not in danger. And I think that that's one of the key things is the echoing event, the echoing experience. Uh, and it could be flashback right to the event or uh, just, and I don't mean that to minimize, um, the, the experience of the terror. Mm -hmm. even when they look around and nothing's happening. Right. I think that that's important. Yes, definitely. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So in talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, I think uh, it's also important to talk about what happens to people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, just to sort of normalize it as a diagnosis. Um, normalize it in the sense that here's what here's what kind of symptoms you might experience. Um, and then, of course, after discussing that, we're, we'll talk, of course, about the importance of post-traumatic stress disorder so that um, people's symptoms, because if you are working on PTSD in a treatment, um, you can expect uh, to see symptoms decreasing. <clears throat> And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. But mm -hmm. so some of the symptoms that people experience is flashbacks, which you've already mentioned, uh, feeling like you're right there in the situation. And, um, and that's where <clears throat> people talk, uh, when, when you discuss the military, um, hearing fireworks going off mm. and they can feel like they're right back in that situation. Um, and, um, and, uh, so flashbacks, um, seeing the image of the, of the trauma all over again, um, 
and of um, dissociation. Um, I had mentioned to Ellen before we got started, the background that I have with me is something that I, an art project that I sort of created today. The uh, visual, the visual background. The visual background, yeah. thank okay. you. And, um, I, and, uh, and so it's sort of a, like my soul collage, if you will, of a soul, soul collage card that I created for my visual background here on Zoom. And uh, the Lady of Shalott, <clears throat> a John Waterhouse painting, is something that came to my mind when I was thinking about dissociation and trying to look for images on the internet to create this visual background. Um, dissociation is when I'm explaining it to um, my clients, I'll often ask them, do you ever have moments where you sort of space out or you feel like you're an autopilot. Um, I had a client who told me he um, a, a trip he, that he takes um, often down south for it's a couple hour trip, and he's on autopilot the entire time and doesn't even recall getting the entire trip. But um, so that's a that's a form of dis that's a type of dissociation. But when you're dissociating, um, what I like to explain to people. That doesn't mean that that person is not there driving the car and that you should be a worry, uh, worried about people with dissociation on the road, um, because definitely you are conscious, but you're just in this other space is the best way I can explain it. And if somebody, uh, he, if somebody were to slam on their brakes in front of somebody having dissociation, they would slam on their brakes, too. They're not in coma or something like that. Um, they're just in a different space. Go ahead. You've got. Can I just put something in there, at, but not to lose your place, because we're going to come back to where you were headed. Um, this is so interesting. So, um, so my uh, my favorite example of dissociation is my very close friend, who was um, sexually abused by her beloved father when she was very young. She would get lost in the um, cracks in the in the ceiling in her room. Oh. So she actually went somewhere and dissociated from what was actually happening because a child can't can't deal with and take in what's exactly. happening, which is a characteristic of any of us when a huge trauma shocking event is happening. The interesting thing about her, she didn't realize that till later on in her life, she's an artist, where she associated, and, and a fine artist with pencil lines, colored pencil lines. And one day she had an awareness after she completed a piece of artwork, oh my God, those pencil lines were the cracks in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put that in. I wanted to say also, which um, we meant to say, but we didn't. Anyone listening to this, if you have been given a diagnosis of PTSD, if you're exploring it for yourself, just take these bits of information as bits of information, okay? Uh, it's very easy. I know, I know the story about medical students, you know, if that's an old story where they read about or they hear about a, an affliction or an ailment and all of a sudden, they've got all the symptoms. Same with psych so, students. Right, we're that way as human beings. So if you've listened to these our conversations before, you know that even though we're talking about something serious, we're talking about in, it in a very casual and, and open way. And we don't plan this conversation. So whatever is coming up, just take it as bits of resource information for you and then try it on and uh, do not take it as a gospel or a hard facts or this is from, we each, as Janine said, we each have different experiences. And now here's, here's the other thing, which is so much fun for me to have these conversations, Janine, because we come upon similar things yet from where we come from, uh, we've de learned different things about it. Exactly. So in the, in the beginning of when I talk with somebody about the hypnotherapy, people who want hypnotherapy, and I'm sort of briefing them about it, they say, oh, you know, I, what if I can't, 
you know, be hypnotized or whatever is their thought. I said, well, human beings are in a trance most of the time. It's really a natural state. And the example I give is, have you ever been driving anywhere? And all of a sudden you arrive there and you go, oh my God, that took less time. Or I wasn't, I guess I wasn't paying attention. And that in some circles of understandings is, is an indication of super concentration. So whether it's super concentration on something you're conscious of or something you're unconscious of, which goes to your point, that, that your, your autopilot can get you where you're going and we don't know where you are <laughs> when you're on your way. So um, humans do go into that kind of... Um, state you know um, and, and, and a lot of times what I mentioned to clients might be an interesting thing for them to do as an adjunct to therapy with me is um, coming to see you um, when they're blocking something mm. and so so that's something that happens with post-trauma uh, especially with children um at such a young age, they don't want to remember certain things. So, I mean, they will maybe say to themselves as five years old, I'm never going to remember this ever again. I won't right. tell myself to, I'm never going to come here ever again. And so then it's, it's off in the, in the back of their head and they've blocked it. So a lot of times, I mean, generally when somebody tells me, oh, I can't remember between ages five to eight, but I know something may have happened. I'm pretty sure that they've had some sort of a trauma. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and that's, and that can be difficult because um, it's hard to work with PTSD if you don't know what we're working with. Um, so, but go ahead. You, so ju you just brought up another important point um, mm -hmm. for any of us that, and you have experienced it, you've shared, and I have experienced that shared with you that we've had the intention to overcome certain things, yet we can't seem to get at it. And that's because early in life, we drew a conclusion, yes. which like I am, or chose a behavior, even in a little child's mind, I am never going to either let this happen again, mm -hmm. or I'm never going to think about this. And mm -hmm. it can even happen pre-verbally. Yeah, because some of us have been um, mistreated when we were very, very young. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. But we both know people who mm -hmm. have made full recoveries. Yes. And so yeah. do not give up on yourself. Yes. You know, stick with it. But and that's, yeah, that's very important. Um, somebody was telling me the other day that um, a psychiatrist had asked him, do you think you're, um, you're going to live with PTSD the rest of your life. Well, my answer to that is if you don't do treatment, yes, you're going to live with PTSD the rest of your life. But why would you want to do that? Um, why would you want to live with the, the trauma, the, the symptoms the rest of your life? We're not going to make it go away. We're not going to make it disappear. It's going to be there. But uh, for me, when you're doing CPT work, the beliefs that you have about the trauma, that's what we're working on. And um, so, and, and it's evidence-based. I, we, with CPT, we actually do the, the test, the PCL5, which is a test to see how, how much your symptoms are bothering you. We do that every single week. And I see scores going down consistently. And I also track those scores, not just on their personal sheets, but I also make a major, um, uh, a main spreadsheet where I collect the data from all of my clients and put them on there. Mm -hmm. So that then now I can show them to other clients because obviously I don't put names on there. Um, and I can show them here are the different years oh, that it's so great to me. Yeah. And from and then I do it from session one to 12 uh, because it's a 12 session treatment model. And so I've collected all my clients data and I can show to people, look, 
Here's the highest scores. Here's the scores at the 12th session so that they can see. And that's a visual for them. And it really is very convincing when they are able to see that evidence in front of their eyes. Um, so um, will you have PTSD the rest of your life? How do you want to answer that, Ellen? Oh, well, first of all, you know, you know me, I'm a big um, proponent of the, the contribution of your attitude and focus. So, you know, to the best is to recognize like what Janine is saying that there's actual proof that uh, people recover and that treatment is effective. And so, you know, and you always want to interview different therapists see who resonates with you. And I'm a big fan of listen to yourself, your inner self, if you can get at that or a gut feeling or this and really pay attention, you know, that if you don't feel comfortable, uh, now you might not feel comfortable at all. And that might be because of the PTSD. Exactly. So you want to be sensible about that too. Uh, because you still are the observer of what's happening. Okay, there's a part of you that's observing and selecting a therapist, selecting a treatment, just like, you know, at, so listen, some people who are so um, encumbered, you know, can't make a selection. So you do the best you can and you keep finding your way and yeah. you don't yeah. give up. And then, you know, I would say, if you feel you have PTSD, then get treatment, you know, look into, and if you're afraid, then look into, um, read books on it, prep yourself, enable yourself to get help. Um, and then absolutely um, count, count on recovery and just keep going at it. Yeah. And it, and it takes a while to dismantle because like what you're saying about dismantling the beliefs and that, you know, that was then and this is now. And that was horrible. It really was horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, you know, for some people, there's a little bit of, you know, I'm plagued with this. I don't deserve, you know, um, I can say, um, you know, if you lost your family in a house fire and you're the only one that survived, you know, then you've got to deal with possibly feeling guilt that you survived and they didn't. Wow. I mean, there's all different elements, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, if you are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, it is important to get into treatment. Um, you, can, you can decrease your symptoms. Um, and it's not just about walking in the door and meeting the therapist, okay, here I am, let's get rid of the PTSD. You have to do some work. Um, you've got to follow up on, in my, in my case with CPT, you have to follow up with the homework assignments that you're being given. Mm -hmm. You've got to do work at home as well as in the uh, session mm -hmm. um, because it's happening outside of the session. We're in there talking about it. But when you're going home, you're having those flashbacks, you're having those nightmares, you're having the, um, the dissociation when you're in conflict, because um, that's often where it comes from. I mean, that's when you often will see mm -hmm. dissociation. Um, that's, that's one of the, the obvious ones. Um, and, and so it's important to come in and talk to somebody and, um, and, and do some work around this. And if and, you, and if you have to ask yourself, oh, why do I need to, I, you know, I've been getting through my life the way I am right now. Why do I need to go and see somebody? It's just going to change, you know, what's going to happen after I do all this work? Am I going to change and be a different person and no longer have any control over my life? Am I going to be weak? Am I going to be um, <clears throat> too, too much sympathy? That's what a lot, that's what I've heard a lot of women who've been sexual abuse survivors mm -hmm. Um, they will say that because they've gotten used to 
controlling things in a certain way with their obsessive behaviors, with their um, their um, ability to perceive that they are controlling situations in their own mind. Um, and so, <clears throat> so often it's like, you know, I've been doing good so far. Why do I need to do this and drum up all this stuff? I think uh, there's, an, uh, there's a great point about that is uh, often um, we people don't perceive that, that that's a step in a process, that that, that development of control um, is a stepping stone. That's like a phase in the development toward, toward a kind of freedom that um, that person is entitled to, as any person is, um, to have full access of their creativity without being attached to control. You don't lose being in charge. In fact, in the treatment, you, you discover that you really are in charge without having to um, be um, forceful in retaining that control um, and without the fear that you're gonna lose it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you deal with things like, you know, there's unconscious things that you get to deal with in this treatment, like, that you might not even be aware of that on some, even some little level, you might've felt responsible for the, for the trauma or deserving of it. And, and those things don't necessarily have to be related to reality because we all grew up from being children. And when we're children, we, we connect the dots of things that we see. And quite frankly, a child cannot connect dots correctly. I mean, you know, and my favorite one is um, like when, when we witness anger and violence together. And those are really two separate things, but very often, when we witness or are the victim of, of violence, there can be some anger dished to us. And so in a child's mind, those things are together. Mm -hmm. So as an adult, a person is afraid to deal with their anger because it's associated with violence. Mm -hmm. And they have made very often, um, a decree inside themselves, I'm never going to be like that. Yeah. Well, but that's yeah. been associated with anger. So we separate the anger and the violence. Anger is a feeling that really needs to be experienced yeah. and violence yeah. is never acceptable. No. Never. No. So, and when they're mixed up together, it is, you, it's, I'm going to say, I think it's practically impossible to get through it unless you break these things apart. So as adults, we can erase the lines between the dots that we associated together, just in our outlook of life that then positions us to really be boomeranged by things later on in life. Yeah. So that's like some of the work yeah. that you get to do. And you can use, uh, you can deal with your anger um, <clears throat> through art, through writing. Um, I think writing is the best way. I was uh, on a group, a uh, Facebook group the other day, and somebody was using, um, they were talking about a piece of Jim Morrison's writing mm -hmm. that was very fragrant um, and very misogynist. And, um, but the way I was talking, uh, what I was mentioning in that particular post is I was saying that <clears throat> as a writer, um, it's not enough to just say, I'm having a bad day, or I feel sad because he broke up with me. When you're writing and you want to express yourself, um, you're going to use very fragrant terms, very mm -hmm. emotional terms, 
that that doesn't mean that you did that. It doesn't mean that, I mean, uh, I think Jim Morrison talks about in one song, killing somebody. Um, he didn't kill anybody as far as we know. Um, but but the but the but lashing out in anger in in his lyrics about what he's talking about his frustration with his parents or what have you um, <clears throat> that's a very wasn't healthy for him to be an alcoholic obviously but it was healthy for him to sing it out in those lyrics and in his poetry um, uh, so that's one way in the Frida Kahlo painting that I have behind me. Uh, a picture of her uh, with the swords, um, I mean, not swords, the arrows inside the deer's body reflected her pain and her anger of being 17 years old and being in a bus accident in Mexico that destroyed her life. She was never able to carry a child to term. So she had tons and tons of anger. Her husband was Diego Rivera was of course a womanizer. Um, so, I mean, her paintings portray that anger in a very, and it's lots of violence in her paintings, but it's very healthy that she did it in the painting and not to her husband or to somebody on the street or what have you. Um, do you see what, you know, you know, that's yes. what I'm trying to yes. get. Yes. And if you, and if you get to choose to speak to a therapist, I mean, you can even say that, listen, are you going to be able to stand my expressions of anger? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, we sit there and we can handle it. Yeah. Uh, we are, I mean, scream it out, let it out, jump it out, because it's just a natural response yeah. to something that's happening, whether, and it could be tears and sadness, mm -hmm. um, hurt. You know, any, any, um, you could have shame. Uh, I had a teacher, um, June Graham, she used to say, birds are meant to fly, fish are meant to swim, and people are meant to feel. And any feelings that we have pushed down because that's the best way we were able to deal with it at the time and since until we have something better, mm -hmm. um, uh, could be viewed as like when you're when you're pushing away. Um, let me think of um, mm, when you're pushing away the feeling of powerlessness because that's how you felt. So I'm never going back there. I never want to have that again. But when you push a, the feeling of powerless away, the flip side of it is a healthy, powerful, which is being having jurisdiction over yourself. So when you put, it's like two sides of a coin. And when you're pushing the so one side away that you dislike, you're actually pushing the whole coin away. Mm -hmm. So you can't really get at feeling powerful while you're also pushing away powerlessness. So when later you arrive at a diagnosis, or uh, the idea of going to a therapist, by this time, you have enough somehow mature consciousness, even if it doesn't feel like it, even if you feel the worst you have ever felt, if you get yourself to help, you have enough consciousness to be able to be helped to feel something that happened a long time ago um, with awareness, mm -hmm. not just in a flashback. Because when you are helped to feel it with awareness, then you can get a healthy response from a therapist, a compassionate response that stimulates your own inner compassion. And you start to bring yourself together on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, that's really how I view it overall. And some people faster. And, and, and to that fa the fact that it may take many of us a long time is not a detrimental thing because you don't want to miss out on all the self-appreciation that there is in the process because you're being helped to see the value of who you are and how you are along the way. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, that's a little insight that I could give on being on the inside of the process, having been on the inside of the process. Yes, absolutely. The same here. Yes. And, and so it's our job as a therapist to hold you, to hold that container in, that, in, our, in our room, which we've created as a sacred space for the people coming into our room. It's important for us to build trust with the client before we begin to delve in to the PTSD work. I mean, we don't, you don't just walk in the door and we say, okay, let's get started. Um, and, uh, and so you, you need to get to know your therapist and you need to make sure, trust your gut feeling. Does it seem like this therapist is, is uh, going to work for me? Does it seem like she gets me? Um, and, or he, or, or he, he, sorry, or he, and, uh, and, and, and you want to make sure you feel safe in that room, that you feel comfortable in that room. And, uh, and speaking of what you were talking about sharing your anger or your sadness, um, people, every time somebody starts crying in my office, they're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cause right. it's like, you're not outside. You're not with your best friends. You're with a therapist. And so I tell people this happens every day in my office. It's okay. If you're crying, that means I must have done something right. Cause I helped you to bring something out of you. I mean, uh, I can't use the Barbara Walters analogy anymore. Cause hardly anybody knows who I'm talking about, but you know, she did used to have people cry. That was the big thing. Her interviews would cause somebody to cry about something. Um, but I love it when people cry in my office. And I've certainly had people yelling in my office before. Um, one time so much so that the downstairs uh, business people came up and knocked on the door. And I just said, I'm okay, we're okay. Um, and then they walked away. But I tell people, um, you're not yelling at me. I mean, if they start cursing and saying she's a bitch or whatever, you're not cursing at me. I'm not taking it personal. I'm just listening and I'm just helping you to express yourself in the best way that you can. Um, because that's just so important. Letting people talk, letting them get it out of their chest, um, pulling that, talking about that monster that they are, that's visiting, visiting them at nighttime. Um, and, um, and bringing that awareness alive in that uh, room. Uh, the, the other thing is um, I noticed in uh, the um, Institute of Mental Health uh, definition went on and it had some symptoms and it talked about nightmares and a lot of people have nightmares um, and it may sound far-fetched, but you can um, get bigger than your nightmares where you're having them, but you're not them. And, um, you know, I think for the longest time, not that I still would care for horror movies or scary things. Um, I just um, couldn't face, um, I don't know, terrible nightmares yeah. and uh, help to become bigger than them that yeah it's like going to a bad movie mm -hmm. or a movie you don't like and yeah you might see yourself in it or you might not see yourself in it and um but there's a lot of things to do with dreams that uh can be very interesting yes and i i just wanted to add to the dream uh conversation that you brought up is that a lot of times what happens with PTSD survivors is that they are there's a theme of that dream that that keeps revisiting them over and over and over and over again, and um, and and what I often will tell military people or sexual abuse survivors, well, any PTSD client actually, I'll say to them the difference between a military PTSD and a um, civilian PTSD is it's a different monster that chases you at nighttime. Mm. But the other thing is that um, for the military, it just happened a year ago, 16 years ago, 
but it's it, it happened as an adult in your consciousness, which is different than a five year old or an eight year old having trauma happen to them. A lot different because um, what I realized the very first time I started working with the military is that they can talk about the 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 smell, the taste. They remember the environment that they were in very, very vividly. Um, they all their sentence senses are heightened so much more so than a child who vaguely remembers the room um, because they were five years old and a lot's happened in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so so that, that's the differences. The symptoms are the same. It's just how they experience those symptoms are a little different. And also the perspective. Um, their perspective is different in some ways. Um, and with the, um, one of the ways the hypnotherapy um, ha can help the person who was a childhood survivor is they can go back to um, just the key aspects that need to be so unhooked, so to speak, and healing can be sent there. And um, I could say that can be done with adults too. And also there's, um, I had a situation where a client, uh, a grandmother, um, had been in a traumatic situation with, with a grandchild mm. where the grandchild was the, um, the victim and the grandma couldn't stop seeing the situation in her consciousness. It just kept replaying. And one of the things that um, we got to do and the grandchild was very, very young, was she was able to have conversations with the grandchild in her mind that were very healing, that were very healing, mm -hmm. where actually in her imagination, you could say, the grandchild could talk back to her and mm -hmm. really help the grandma recover so that's a little different kind of uh, angle. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a little gestalt-ish, you know, like where you sit somebody mm -hmm. in, a, in an empty chair. Yes. And you have a conversation back and forth. And by the way, that is very effective. Um, I, that's worked with adults who have been carrying angst and anger toward parents who had already passed away, who were perpetrators in their life. And they were able to divest themselves of everything. I've witnessed this and actually been able to walk away from that particular episode of therapy, so to speak, without that, without all that. Without, and, you know, each person, say again. Without holding on to that pain. Yes, yes. So, you know, and different things work for different people. And I always like the idea that, you know, the people who can benefit from what comes through me show up at my door. People who benefit from it, the way it comes through you, come through your door. Right. You know, and that's like... Uh, yeah, there's no mistakes. And maybe it, it's even more than no mistakes. Maybe we're attuned to each other and attract, you know, what's going to work. So exactly. Yeah, we attract the clients that are meant to be in our room. Right. And they are attracted, you know, they're out there magnetically yeah. looking for what's going to be the best fit for me. Yes, so. exactly. I've even had people who have, <clears throat> um, I had a person who came to see me and I, I can be a little blunt sometimes and I have to catch myself there because I'm an ex-social worker with Children's Protective Services, eight years, um, 
having to like speak real quick and come up with solutions real quick um, and speaking to people on the spot, like in, in uh, outside of courtrooms and so forth and so on. So I haven't really lost my, um, my ability to get to the point. And I have been in situations with clients where a couple of times people have said to me the next week, that was a little abrupt the way you handled that. And um, so I've had to rework building trust with them because I was mm. too abrupt in the, in the first time. Uh, I just want to point out how great it was that they said that they that. had the courage to say yeah. it. Yes. I know that there have been people who have left working with me without saying it oh i'm sure there are other people who've done the same thing with me that's amazing I haven't said that and and i i praise them when they do say that too i'm like i'm so grateful you had the courage to come back and tell me that because that's so important i even had a person who returned a year after seeing mm, me because mm. of something that we talked about um Sometimes I think it's obvious. That's where my problem lies. <laughs> well, it is obvious to us. Yes. Just like if we were in their seat. Exactly. We even without their, we even without the training and they were looking at us, they would see what's obvious too. Yes, um, exactly. Well, and, and they do see what's obvious. Um, <clears throat> Every, we, we all know what the answers are. They're all swirling around in our head telling us, like we talked about in our last, uh, our last two videos, um, turn right and we turn left instead because our ego says, no, we want to go here. We don't want to go right. But we always know what the answers are, but we don't necessarily want to hear them. Oh, did I say, I must have told you this the first time with my first therapist. I probably told this, but anyway. I'm not sure. He was saying something and I'm sitting there going like this. Oh, yes. You know, and he said, oh, you know what? I'll find another way to say it. And I said, no, no, just say it louder. <laughs> I wanted to hear it, but boy, I didn't want to it. It's hard to hear it. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> it, it can be difficult, though, because um, we're walking on. Well, we're not walking on eggshells, but when we're talking with clients who have been exposed to trauma. With sensitivity, it's sensitivity. It's sensitive. And you have to be careful not to re-traumatize. Oh. Um, yeah. And you don't know. I mean, that's why I'm saying you don't know what word is going to resensitize. Uh, well, I, I think I mean, that this traumatize, is. Sorry. Right. So this is important for the person who's working on their post-traumatic stress. Uh, symptoms. And that is to know that, and I think, I mean, certainly a person does know that they could be triggered at any time. Mm -hmm. And so I think building that into the relationship in the beginning, so to not feel bad about yourself if you're not trusting the therapist, and to be honest about it. Yeah. It's to say be what honest I, about it. Say what uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can tell you, like with the hypnotherapy, somebody would come and say, oh, you know what? I want the hypnotherapy and, and I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, we really need like three or four sessions beforehand before your subconscious is ready, is going to like even consider me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, because you've got that fear in there. And, you know, we could, and all these things we could say about any of us and that it's in a range. And, um, you know, um, for some of us, um, there's a difference between um, post traumatic stress disorder and being attached to victim consciousness. Mm -hmm. We could be um, healed from our trauma and, and yet have other subtle reasons to hold on to feeling like a victim. So that's a little different kind of work. Um, so for those of you who are 
analyzing yourselves while you're listening to us, I can only encourage you to have the broadest view of yourself possible. And then, and then you could come to a therapist and check it out. You know, I've been told I have PTSD because that's another thing. You could have relatives that label you and you could have a doctor that labels you and you mm-hmm. want to see where they're getting their, their mm-hmm. symptom list from. And yeah. mm-hmm. you still want to be as discerning a consumer of medical and mental health services as you can be. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always very suspicious when people come in with a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm I'm feeling them out like what, who was this person? What was the uh, situation you were in? Especially if somebody was in a psych hospital and they got a diagnosis, right? right. You tend to get uh, certain patterns from psychiatric hospitals, mm-hmm. and you know. So my way of explaining that is. What was the frame of mind you were in when you walked in that door? Right. right. And that's how you were being labeled. Yes. That great point. Yeah. That's how you were being labeled from that, that person that you were being, but that person that you were being is not the person that you are right now in my office. Right. So, you know, I like to discover with the person, um, even if they have a PTSD diagnosis, I don't just take that for granted. Before I and that's part of CPT work. We have to qualify them before we can get started working with them. Um, and so, but anything bipolar, whatever. And um, um, I want to see, I want to see that person, and I want to hear their symptoms, um, and and then make a decision from that. And sometimes I've actually sent people, not for PTSD, but for other things. Um, I had a, a 60, 60 year old woman uh, who came in and I sent her to a psychological evaluation mm-hmm. and turned out she had bipolar her, her entire life. She had no idea that she had this because the symptoms that she had for bipolar worked for she and her family. Right. Right. Until it didn't work. I, well, that's the important point. What difference does it make if it's working? I mean, unless, you know, people are being hurt one way right. or another, exactly. you know, working in, a, in an awful way, yeah. um, you know, or if it's part of a system that, you know, families have their own languages, different ways of caring for each other. Yeah. Um, but the key point is until it didn't work. And... That is great. And so uh, diagnoses in general um, are okay for a guidepost to get more information or uh, to tip off a trained healthcare professional on offering different types of treatment Mm -hmm. with the client. And uh, otherwise, one thing to watch out for when you have a diagnosis is how attached am I to the diagnosis. Yes. Because that happens after a while, which makes it harder to be your natural free self. And let go of it. Mm -hmm. Because it becomes part of you. And I think that's what I mean. That's also what I want, what I was meaning earlier when people, you know, why should I deal with this? I've been living with it my entire life. Right, right. No, um, but when you've got to walk into your job and say to them, okay, I have PTSD and here's what's going to happen. Don't come behind me. Don't surprise me. Don't tap me on the shoulder. Don't blah, 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 blah. When you have to live your life like that, that's somebody who needs to be in treatment. Don't yeah, let be- be your life. Right, right. Yeah. And that, and like we said earlier, there is life beyond this yes. and it's a process. Uh, when someone comes to me, like what you were saying, I'm listening for who the person is and what, what healing responses do they need that they haven't had to, um, to their judgment, their self-judgment, possibly their, their stuck thoughts about how they are, their limiting beliefs. Very often, um, uh, 
we haven't heard in our natural paths of life from other people, I don't know, um, promising ways of interpreting things. I mean, we've, we've under seen limiting ways of interpreting things. Um, and I don't know which training or where I heard this about in every moment, there's like, um, you could view it sort of in an expansive way or in a limiting way as an opportunity or as a, you know, a closed door. So even that concept to view whatever you're looking at in yourself and that it's possible to choose one way or another or a different way to view something just to try it on to see if it alleviates stress um, and then to see what that means to a person as a way to sort of work, work, help the person work their way out of um, an oppressive limiting view of themselves. And because you deserve this, you deserve- Everyone, it. everyone. Mm -hmm. We have creativity, we have unique traits. And, you know, I know we often compare ourselves to other people, but when we appreciate how unique we are, even if we all have the same feelings, similar thoughts, they're all organized in a different way. So that's the uniqueness. So, you know, we really do defy comparison. So we're being unfair to ourselves if we're um, viewing ourselves in a detrimental way because we're not something else. If we like a trait in someone else and we let them look in ourselves, and see if that's something we want to develop or if somebody has a skill. And we may or may not have the interest motivation to learn to do that, even though we wish we could, we have other things that we'd rather do or want to apply ourselves to. I mean, I've come upon that in a number of ways in myself and have felt quite relieved when I let go of, <laughs> And face the truth that I'm not willing to put the effort into something mm -hmm. that I would need to, to be able to advance in that certain way, or moving myself along and seeing what I would like to learn or could learn. And then sometimes I discover I'm satisfied with the outcome and it satisfies me more than I thought it would, because I'm not taking it to the nth degree that someone else is taking it. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, sort of have an open, more open mind about our abilities, possibilities, opportunities, and even feeling bad about things. Mm -hmm. So you deserve to get treatment for yourself, mm -hmm. your family, and help your children. Mm -hmm for your wife, mm -hmm. for your girlfriend, for your parents, whoever, you deserve to do this for yourself. Um, because it's not, it's not fair to the people around you that you're having to set boundaries with them about something. Set boundaries, yes, I'm all for that. But if you have to do that, get treatment, get into treatment. If you're having to live your life, having people walk on eggshells around you and having to um, be at your beck and call because, oh, he might uh, spring a leak any minute and start becoming very angry and we have to watch out for dad. We have to whatever, hope he takes his pills today, whatever, you know, don't do that. You deserve to be in treatment. You deserve to. Um, work through these symptoms and have a better quality life. I mean, if you survived the situation and the people down the street didn't because the tornado busted their houses, 
or if you survived and that guy in the tank didn't, he died. He's a father of two children, you're single. If that happened, there's a reason. There's something you are supposed to get from this. They fulfilled their purpose in life, whatever that was. You're fulfilling your purpose in life, whatever that is. Don't give up on yourself. Get into treatment if you have PTSD because you deserve it and you've been given this chance to have a life because you're supposed to learn something from this. And by learning some from, something from this, you're going to benefit other people, not just yourself. So that's my thing that I wanted to have people take away, take away from this. Mm, that's great. Um, it reminds me of um, years that I was embroiled in anger uh, toward my mother mm -hmm. and um, my sweet husband, who, you know, um, he had a lot of compassion for me and he took a lot of guff. And I would just say, and I was in therapy. I say, look, I'm so sorry, you know, that this is leaking out on you or I snap at him or something like that. I said, you know, I hope you can hang in here. You know, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So, you know, that was a situation where the client, you know, had awareness mm -hmm. and still the person around me, I'm sure he felt like he needed to be cautious, you know, and not everybody has that patience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew, I don't know, I, he did stick around, which was a great thing. Um, but, you know, I suppose I couldn't blame somebody for not sticking around. 50 years. You know, so, um, and all the while it felt uncomfortable and it was a strain and that was even while working on myself. Yeah. So, but I did have um, people who encouraged me and gave me that hope, you know, and the feeling of deserving. Um, but I, to add to that, Ellen, you and your husband are mature, are a mature, healthy couple. And not all people are mature, healthy people. And mm -hmm. a lot of times we attract unhealthy people when we are suffering inside from whatever it is. Right. Oh, absolutely. A lot of times we attract that. And so um, that's where we again, we have to work on that, be in treatment, have yeah. that self-awareness to be able to say, okay, I'm seeing this pattern here. I keep attracting these same kind of people over and over again. Mm -hmm. What do I need to learn from this? It doesn't help to say, oh, it was their fault. They did this, they did that, whatever. Um, what are you doing to attract that type of person into your life? Mm -hmm. expand mm -hmm. your consciousness on that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. accept the challenge accept that challenge and um, take it to your therapist talk to them about it <clears throat> and work through it um, and have a better life be able to attract that good person mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. meant to be for you in your life and even um, you know and I can speak to that clearly but I'm not going to go there to TMI, but I can speak that for that clearly that no matter how old you are, um, and you may say to yourself, um, I thought I worked through all of this. I thought I had it down pat. I know I under I, I, I knew before I met this person that I was ready to go. And yet, once again, the universe, God, goddess sends that person into your life and you walk away feeling wow, there I did it again. So obviously there's one more thing I need to work on. Well, I think that's so great that, you know, that that conclusion of, okay, there's something left mm -hmm. to learn or get from this. And I think that um, you're bringing up a good point that the feeling could be the same. You know, here we go again. Yet, um, 
you know, with help, a person is able to see that even with that, that there were shades of newness and difference from how things were handled before. And we're not like a done deal. It's like be, being a pianist, given the next level of challenge in a new kind of piece to play, you know, and, um, you know, and we keep going and we keep learning. Yes. So yes. it's good to have, um, you know, and I, and like what you said about me, one of the things that I appreciate about you is like that small, that, that the way, you know, the way that you can express, oh, there it was again. And okay, what next, next, what's next? So I think uh, keeping our spirits up once, once a person can get a grip on that, you know, then you're off and running because then you're uh, facilitating your own growth. Exactly. Well, I think we've held the viewers on for an hour now. <laughs> so we should come to a close. Um, Janine and Ellen here in freezing cold Ohio. Taking right, right. So <laughs> Janine Vig, Ellen Siegel. And um, oh, one thing that you said earlier is something about being an ex-social worker in child children's services. Or, so yes, yes, right. So I just want to make sure you're not an ex-social worker. So I want the viewers to know that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, ah, is that like uh, with the Marines? Um, you're never an ex-Marine. You're always a Marine. That's right. So with a social worker, you're always a social always a social worker, even when you change uh, hats. Hats, right? Got a different one on. Well, this has been great. Thank you for joining us, and Janine, I love this. Thank you. I do too. All right. Bye bye. All right. See you next time. <laughs>